been on the court, assistant professional, head pro, director of tennis, uh, as Pat said, Florida. Here, the last time I was in this ballroom was in um, 2005. And I left here, spent some time with the USDA, and we helped launch the Tennis Service Representatives Program. We've got at least two, three, is Alan still here? Alan Jensen? Yeah. yeah, three TSRs in the room. Um, I have, uh, I, I launched the consulting business and the whole purpose of that was to, at that time, do anything I could to, to make a dollar, to be honest with you, right? Um, but we started to focus more on helping clubs identify what they needed when they were looking to hire a director of tennis and to help them identify the right person with the right skill set to match their needs. I have uh, opened and subsequently closed a couple of gyms. So I've, I've been on that side of the business world and for about the past year have really refocused my energy back into the consulting world. And candidly, someone said to me once, uh, they explained recently about the difference between an aim and a purpose. And I took this very much to heart. Because your aim when we, um, when we get up every morning is to do something that will provide service to people and um, make a livelihood, make a living for, for ourselves and our family. And they said, that's good, Mark. You need to go out and do your best at that. But tell me about your purpose. And clearly, I'm a teacher at heart. I think we all are. We're all teachers. But the reality is that I've really seen a need in helping clubs hire tennis professionals to help tennis professionals understand what it is that clubs are looking for. And, and let's, clubs are too broad. General managers and search committees. So other, you know, we just heard Jeff talk about committees. And there are not typically a lot of tennis experts, but they're hiring against some metrics, right? So if I can help them understand what those metrics should be, and I can help tennis professionals understand how to meet those objectives, then that's my purpose. So the new passion is definitely about trying to help my fellow pros be more effective and, and understand more how they can succeed at a higher level within the job market. Okay, so that's the premise. So I want to start with a question. And the question is around the, the concept of changing circumstances. And there are a couple of if questions. The first one, we all know someone who has had to answer this question, that the job that they're in has suddenly, the circumstances have changed and they need to find a new role. So the question is, what would that role look like? Where would it be? And how long would it take for us to find that role? So that's a bit of a, a, bit of a Debbie Downer for late in the day, right? To think about that type of circumstance. But what if you're in a role right now, and I know many of you personally, and I know that you're in this, this situation where you might, you might be quite happy for the next 20 years doing what you're doing, growing into new opportunities within your current role, expanding your skill sets and your knowledge base, bringing more value to your club, and never ever leaving. And that's great. Then there are some people I'm sure that would think to themselves, maybe one day I want something that will be a little bit more in line and aligned with my personal and my professional goals. When I left Boca Raton, Florida, and we were talking about this last night at dinner, I had a pretty tough membership down there. And when I came to uh, Atlanta, that was a very specific lifestyle choice. My daughters were eight and one at the time. They, could, they were not welcome at my club in Florida, and I wasn't necessarily looking for a club where they could be members but I wanted them to feel welcome coming to see where dad went to work every day. So I made a career decision now, you know, 20 years ago, that was based almost exclusively on a lifestyle decision, not necessarily a, a specific career goal, although I certainly was not looking to go backwards. So this can happen to all of us, and we all know people to, to whom that has happened. So a couple more questions or thoughts um, one is the concept of luck, we've all heard this saying, right? When, when preparation meets opportunity, right? That person got lucky and 
Zig Ziglar said it a little differently. He used the end game of success. He says success is when preparation and opportunity meet. But can we all agree on one thing? The common uh, denominator there was the word preparation. So I heard someone say earlier today, buy in with me on something. Buy in with me as we go through the next 50 minutes, give or take, on the concept that we should be preparing, we should be thinking about what the future holds. Anyone have life insurance? Same concept, right? Not a whole lot different. Give it some thought. The great news that I, I feel about having spent the day here, and I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm pretty excited, pretty charged up, because I haven't done this, this being sit in the room of my colleagues for a day, for probably, well, I went to the Florida Division Convention last June, that was the first time I'd done it in probably three years. This was a real treat today. More importantly, the topics that we heard from Joel first thing this morning, even God, God love Chuck and his budget, right? Pretty important. But if we go through every one of the presentations today, and I think they're going to relate to the, to the subjects and the, and the concepts that we're going to talk about here in the next few minutes. Okay? So what's involved? What's the buy-in involved? Well, the concept is whether you are preparing for something that may be unknown or preparing for something that you want to aspire to and go after, you need to think about what that goal or those goals might be. And one of the things that I strongly recommend is that as you think about those goals that you assess where you are professionally, what you do, what you like, what you're good at, what you might think about doing, where you think there might be some gaps, and by doing that assessment, you can be sure that your goal aligns with who you are and what you've done professionally. So you've got to have those two things line up. And sometimes, after you do that assessment, you may say, yep, I'm on the right track, and I'm going to go from here to this type of place by this time, and that's, I'm, I'm ready for that. It's just like just waiting on the right opportunity, the right time. Or you might say, I need to recalibrate that goal for right now. I need to think about it. I need to fill some gaps, build some, some skill sets, and I'll get there, but I might have to go here before I go here. Okay? Now, the next buy-in is that as you complete that assessment, there's some, some steps that need to take place after that. And as you think about that, that's your action plan for your goals, whatever that might be. And those, that action plan, those next steps can be about the long term or they can be about the short term. But either way, as you start to think about your next opportunity, you're trying to ensure that you have the right skills in place and that you've had the right experiences when that right opportunity presents itself. And the only way that that's possible, Jeff talked about going from um, the landings to the athletic club, right? The first step in that process is getting an interview. Without that interview, it's not gonna happen. So the second part of the process is presenting yourself in the right way to the right people at the right time, and we're going to cover both of those concepts today. We're going to do that by taking a little look at what a lot of us now refer to as our personal brand and focus on the importance of network. That's where we're headed. Purposeful. Who was it this morning that talked about definitions? That was you, Tim, this afternoon, right after lunch, right? I was like, yeah, man after my own heart, a wordsmith, right? But you know, I said, hey, what am I talking about? I'm talking about being purposeful. I said, well, what does that really mean? And there's the definition. Having resolve, showing determination. And I'm thinking about my career, asking a question about your career and saying, well, wouldn't you want to be resolute? Wouldn't you want to be determined about getting somewhere? And again, that could be a doing a better job at what you've done for 15 years for another 15 years. That's okay too. 
but being resolute about that, having determination about that, taking action about that. So in the word Smith capacity, I start to look at what, what other synonym, synonyms are out there and what other definitions might apply to your career path, to my career path. I'm thinking, yeah, I want to be conscientious about this. I want to be very deliberate. I want to be both imaginative but judicious. Right? I really want to pay attention to this. I want to, you, you know, I've done a lot of reading on this subject recently, and the common theme that I found is that you don't have to envelop yourself with this 24-7, 365. It's a little bit here, a little bit there. It's a Sunday here, conference there but it's a little bit over time that prepares you for where you determine that you want to go. The one I settled on, because we use it a lot, is proactive. You have to be proactive. Now the definition, Tim, right? And what I liked about this was that it talks about building something or taking action, like creating or controlling a situation basically before it controls you. So taking the initiative, getting out ahead of something before it comes down and you find either you are unprepared or you want to go somewhere and you're just not ready to get there yet. And again, as I talk today, I'm going to use the example of someone that I have been working with in a coaching capacity, but a lot of my perspective is what I'm hearing from club managers and search committees as they go through that peeling of the onion to decide who they want to invite to interview and ultimately who they hire. So it's a little different perspective. So your next opportunity, think about that. You want to build the necessary skills, formally maybe, so this would be a formal type education day, or through experience, through the right experiences over time. So you've got to have the right experiences for where you want to go within a timeline. Yes, the timeline has to be elastic because you can't define and say, I'm going to get this job by exactly this date, or I'm going to achieve this certification. But you are working towards a general timeline. The concept, the purpose is to be well positioned when the opportunity comes. The second component, being able to present yourself successfully, if you are an assistant professional or someone entering the profession, you need to present yourself to a tennis director, correct? They're the ones typically hiring assistant pros and head pros. If you are a tennis director looking to be hired as a director at another club or a head pro looking to be hired as a tennis director, you need to present yourself to general managers, search committees. So you know your audience, you're well known in advance, who, who your target point of conversation is, your target point of influence, if you will. So it's all about getting in, invited to the interview. So, what should your next opportunity be? That is not a specific question that I'm looking for an answer for, but it's a question that I'm going to suggest you ask, ask yourself on an occasional basis. So, I really thought hard about whether or not I wanted to show this slide and the next slide. Because there's a lot of ways of, of skinning the proverbial cat or uh, possum or cat, cat. We'll stick with cat, probably safer, right? So, as, as we look at, this may or may not be the timeline. I don't know. But it's a timeline I've seen. Someone enters the profession, as an assistant pro, they might spend a year, two, they might assume or be given some additional responsibilities, maybe an area of the program to oversee, maybe it's overseeing the junior program, the summer camp, maybe the, the team program, maybe the maintenance staff, so you've got some HR responsibilities, some budget responsibilities, but there's growth and accountability over time. And maybe that's a project or projects that an assistant might take on for two, three, four years and have the opportunity to be hired as a head professional. 
And with that comes a little bit more responsibility, uh, certainly the opportunity to learn from a great director. The networking will grow over that time, the skills develop will occur over that time, and that could be a four, five, six, three, two year pro you know, process, who knows. But ultimately, somewhere in that first decade, it's not unusual for a person who aspires to that role to be in a director of tennis role. So that is one pathway, illustration only, right? And then I, I put some dollars and some and kind of some time behind this. And by no means is this suggested to be exactly how every job should or does end up. But that assistant pro might get a small base, they might not. They might be on the court for most of the working week. They might are probably, they are not probably receiving 100% of their lessons at that point. Um, and they might earn somewhere in that range. That might grow over time, may morph into a head pro role over time. But this industry tends to reward the directors ultimately at a slightly higher ratio or job over job rate. There's not a lot of differences early on in the career pathway. So if money is a driver, the director role is probably a target. May not be the target, but it could be a target. And that's assuming that you don't go in some other direction within a line to or even maybe out of the tennis industry. So there's lots of different pathways there. So the answer to that rhetorical question is it depends. And you're going to hear me say that phrase several times today. It depends. It depends on what your goal is. It depends on where you are today in your career. And that's why I've started to use what I call a career SWOT assessment. And I've done this in my coaching just to ask questions in, in a non-threatening, developmental, supportive fashion. Because they're questions that only I can answer about myself and you can answer about yourself. Now a little prompting, a little third perspective, or a little, a little objective is always good. So I'm going to, to share some information and we'll just pretend that this is a, um, a mythical tennis professional out there, okay? This is generally about a person that I, I've done some coaching with. And this person is located in the Midwest and they would like to, their first point of contact was, I would like to move to Florida and work at a country club. So that's a pretty broad statement, right? Do you know anyone that might be able to help? That was sort of the first outreach. So after some conversation, we, we dived into this. And I'm touching at first, the obviously, the strengths and the opportunities. So we'll call that the, what would that be, the left side, the revenue, the plus side of the ledger, right? And if you go through this exercise, everything sits on the plus side because you're really analyzing and assessing and making a plan going forward. So this particular professional, great personality, uh, strong on court, great leadership skills, talks really well and, and very confident. Uh, by his own admission, runs great events, has put together a good staff, um, has high performance, you know, great, great skill set, lots of strengths and many more. On the opportunity side, he said, hey, my wife's family is actually in Jacksonville. We kind of thought about Florida at some point, might be fun. Um, what other opportunities are there? He likes to play tournaments, doesn't get much of a chance in the Midwest. Plenty of tournaments in Florida, right? Um, his wife works in the hotel industry. I thought that was kind of cool because Florida is full of hotels. And he has a young, I guess two children, but the oldest was six, right? So why did I think of that as being an opportunity? Um, the older, 
kids get and get into school and so forth, a little more difficult to relocate. Not impossible, but certainly they're not at that high school age where they don't want to leave at all. But we, we agreed that that was going to be an opportunity. So you see out to the side there the word gaps. And ultimately, you'll see that phrase used in terms of where someone is, where I am versus where I want to go. What am I missing? What do I need to do differently or better or in some way um, that will make me more suitable for where I want to go? So we looked at the other two components, the weaknesses and the threats. Now, because of the type of job that this individual is a director of tennis at an indoor commercial club, he doesn't have the Chuck Gill type budget development experience. Remember Chuck said some, some pros are just given a budget? That was him. He had to manage the budget, but he didn't really get an input from his owner, or he didn't get to give input to the owner in putting that budget together. And again, those of us who know indoor pros know that that's not completely uncommon. He doesn't have country club experience. He doesn't really have pro shop experience. There's a small pro shop in his club, but he has no role in it, no committee experience, no clay court experience other than playing a little bit. Um, he hasn't really adopted any uh, opportunity to access any of the other racket sports yet, and his network is, by his own admission, fairly low. Okay? Uh, threats. Well, he's 35 years of age. Uh, issue, he said he's, he's got a little, um, little tweak in his right knee, so we've kind of talked about that in terms of his teaching longevity. Um, oldest child six. Uh, nine years, so this was not 100% correct. He's five years as a head pro, two, sorry, five years as a director of tennis, two years at the head, as a head pro at that same club, and two years as a head pro in his previous club. So nine years total. That's his career path. But he, if we were to say what type of pro is he, right? Is he a country club pro, uh, public parks pro? Uh, what, what type of pro is he? Indoor? Yeah, he's an indoor pro. He's been there all his career, right? So that's a threat when he starts to think about changing his career channel, the type of club that he's going to work in. Now, do I say that that's the case? Do you say? No. Committees perceive that and, and general managers perceive that, whether it's right or not. What's more important and more relevant here is there's definitely some gaps, correct? Between where he is, he is a director of tennis. So he's got the title, that's a good thing, that's important, but he's got some gaps. So let's take a look. This is how it looks in its entirety. This is the SWOT analysis of this individual's career, right? And candidly, 85% of this is uh, things that he readily was able to pick up on just by asking the question. So this is not um, this is not a science thing. This is just a matter of asking some hard questions, right? Some logical questions. So what are the gaps? Well, we won't read them, but there's a ton of them, right? And as you start to look at this, some are probably more important than others. Now, he shared with me that he had sent some cover letters and sent some resumes out for jobs. And his concern was that he hadn't received a response. Not that he hadn't gotten an interview. Now, I totally, you know, I hate that when I hear that story. Every search I do, I send a letter to every person who is not selected by the committee and thank them for taking the time to put the time and energy into applying. And, and I hope that the, that the, you know, it's not always a club manager, it's very often a tennis a, a search committee. But, you know, he was not hearing back at all. Um, so, we started to think about how these gaps may be addressed in the short term and long term. So let's look at the, a couple of questions right from the top. And the answers are self-evident, but they're worth going through the question. Does he have the core skills of a director of tennis? That's the question. He has 
leadership skills. He is a personable guy. Um, I have not verified this, but he believes that he's very good on the court. He's reported to a general manager. He's a director of tennis by title now. He enjoys doing a lot of the things that tennis directors do. He has a good staff, HR capacity. He has stability. And he's led a full service teaching program. Nuts to bolts, soup to nuts, whatever, right? So how about that experience relative to what he wants to do? Is his experience relative experience? So remember we talked about the core skills, but then also making sure that you have the right experiences at the right time. The reality is, as you look at the minimal budget experience, no country club, no committee, clay courts other than playing, pro shop, uh, no rackets, multiple rackets, you know, paddle and uh, pickle and pop tennis, no special events, therefore no food and beverage. So is a search committee or a Florida GM going to hire him as a director of tennis? No, it's not going to happen, right? And he, know, he knew that. He didn't need me to tell him that. But he still has this aspiration to not spend, so there's a, there was a, a negative and a positive to this. So the first thing he said, one of the first things he says, I cannot see myself, Mark, doing the same thing for the next 30 years. He's 35 years old, and he can't see himself teaching on those indoor courts for 35 hours a week for the next 30 years. That was really what this was all about. And he has aspirations. His, fam his wife would like to go to Florida. She would like to get closer, somewhere in the south at the very least. He personally would like to work at a country club. And while he, and I think he ultimately would understand that the challenges, while they're different than the commercial club, they, they exist nonetheless, right? This is what his goals were. So the question was to this gentleman, would you, you want to be a director of tennis? pretty soon, right, in, in southern climate, right? Yep, I want to do that. And he's 35 years old. I said, well, how about you push that goal out? Would you be willing to look at that as a five-year goal? And this is where the assessment came <coughs> in. He said, well, the reality of it is that that's what I want to do. But as we all know, anyone ever applied for a job and just missed out, right? You get all excited and then, ah, right? So he kind of had this bugaboo, he really wants to do this. So we started to think about what his next opportunity could be, to, could be depending upon the goal. Now, as we look at his original goal, right, director of tennis, now we're going to recalibrate it now, director of tennis at a small to medium sized Jacksonville Country Club making $100,000 a year within the next five years. So I said, professional legs, how, how would that be? And he's like, yeah, sign me up, but what happens in the meantime, right? So before we go any further, and again, this is a story of someone who had this goal. Your goal could be to go across town. Your goal could be in 1980, Nine, I moved about a mile and a half. Boca Lago, country club, 20 courts. The job was better than any job I ever thought I'd ever had. Yet there was something down the road, and that's what I wanted. That was Boca West, and, but I moved a mile. Right? So it doesn't matter how far your journey is. It's about getting it successfully, ultimately. Right? So let's look at the goal before we go too much further. We know it has to be one of those smart goals, right? So he's very specific if this was his goal, right? Director of tennis in Jacksonville, small to medium sized club. You'll know why, we'll share why that's up there in just a moment. Um, he picked his type of club because he wanted country club. That was always a part of his goal. Measurable, obviously, based upon the outcome. Achievable, is it realistic? So 
So realistic? Can say, can we? Anyone can do it, right? It's America, for God's sake. Of course we can do it. Right? And he believes, and I believe, that he can do this. But he did some homework. He, really, he did the assessment. He has since put a plan in place. And guess what? There is precedent. I personally know pros who have moved from a northern climate to Florida, transitioned through a head pro to a director of tennis role. So it's not the first, he wouldn't be the first person to ever do this. So is the goal relevant? Well, it certainly is relevant because his family is important to him. He, he knows that he doesn't want to be on the court for the rest of his life. And he knows he's currently a director, so he understands what that's all about. And then time sensitive. So he set a time, he said five years. Um, it has to be an elastic timeline. I want to impress that point. And the question is, is it a stretch to get there? by the time he's 40, five years time. Yeah, it's gonna be hard. But I think a lot depends on what he does in the meantime. And this was the, the, this was the dodge or the weave before you go forward. This is the sidestep. This is, in your old world, Jeff, it's blocking the tackler, right? It's, it's dodging the tackler. Obviously, I played Australian rules, I'm not very football, but yeah, you get the point. So this was his, his little transition. And when I talked earlier about the ultimate goal versus the immediate goal, sometimes that is the fastest way to having a realistic success outcome. Something that makes sense that you are well prepared for and, and that you earn. So this ended up being this individual's intermediate or immediate goal. His objective is to be, to be hired as a head tennis professional in the market where he ultimately wants to be a director of tennis. And upon talking to his wife, assuming she can get a job, they could do and, and succeed at that type of income as a head professional. And in the Florida market, as a head professional, that is a reasonable income. That is an income that can be achieved. So yes, the goal is specific. Now, I don't know if you picked up on this, but he decided that it might make more sense for him to try and get into a bigger club. So if he could work alongside a director as a head pro in a big club, maybe he would be considered more favorably as a director at a smaller club at some point in the future, where a search committee might say, if he could handle that in that scale, I feel confident or we feel confident that he can handle this at our scale. Maybe, maybe not, but this was how his, his thinking evolved. Um, measurable, achievable, relevant. So next to relevant here, there's a, a point that becomes very important on the interview side, on the interviewee, uh, interviewer side. And we've all heard this, why do you want this job? Why, Mr. Director of Tennis, would you come from your Director of Tennis role and want to work for me, the Director of Tennis at you know, the Jacksonville Country Club, as a head professional? And how long are you going to stay here with me? Right? We've all heard that question. Why do you want to be here? Why do you want the job? Well, he has an incredibly honest and realistic and purposeful why story. Family, I need to build my skill set. I need to gain some experience. I want to work, work alongside a successful director and I'll give you the next five years of my professional life. Now, I'm looking at some of the directors in the room and I don't know about you, but if I had a head pro come to me when I was a director and tell me that they'd give me five years guaranteed, I would have taken it every time as my number two person. Anyone disagree with that? Right? Because ultimately, we want our professional team to aspire. We want growth amongst our people, correct? So five years, head pro, that's a great trade -off. So. The question is, can he do that within a year? 
because he's, he's like, you know, I need to do something. And right now he's being proactive, correct? What would happen if all of a sudden his circumstances would change and all of a sudden he would have to look for that next opportunity next week? This might become a lot harder because now he has to interview disingenuously. He wants to move to Florida, but I need a job today in his hometown. So by being proactive, he's getting out ahead of this. And that was really the, the message that, that I wanted to share here. Now, is it a stretch? Well, again, my favorite saying, it depends. So this is his new goal. And it depends on a couple of different things. It depends on how he presents himself. Who's he going to present himself to? Director, Director of Tennis, right? Okay. Um, it depends on how well he addresses his gaps. Now, think about the gaps. Would a director of tennis hire someone who has no clue what to do on the clay courts? Probably that would be a tough reach, particularly if there's good competition for that job, right? So there's other gaps there that he needs to address quickly, proactively, but with purpose, because this is his goal. His first objective is get the interview. And, and that applies these three steps, the top two, how well you present yourself, how well you address your gaps. That applies to, um, Jeff, you're sitting here, so you get the, the, the brunt of this. You've been 11 years, 12? 11 years. ACC. So if you decided you wanted to be a director of tennis somewhere else, right? you'd have to make sure that you covered these same bases, just like this person is covering these bases to move from Midwest to Florida, director at an indoor to head pro at a, at a country club. It doesn't matter what the role is, these steps are a proactive way of preparing for what's next. So he's got a goal, he knows what, he knows where, he's done his assessment, he's got a timeline, and now he's gonna look at what those steps are. His whole purpose, his whole objective, get invited to the interview. Okay, what are the gaps? What gaps does he need to address? At least he needs to get a, a basic knowledge base, get his hands dirty, get involved with some clay courts, find, go online, go to a seminar, spend his day off alongside a, another professional at a clay court country club this spring. He has no rackets. A lot of the Florida clubs now at least have pickleball, at the very least. Most of the jobs in the Northeast, if you don't know and understand paddle, you're not going to be considered. Paddle is becoming incredibly popular and has been for a long time, but growing even more so, not just in the, the nuts of the Northeast, but across the Midwest and the Missouri Valley and even out West. I even have two clubs in Charleston that have paddle ball. Right. So, special events, his network is local, so he's got some work to do. Now, we're not going to get too granular here, and the resume and the cover letter, pretty darn important, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that today either. What we are going to talk about is this part of the whole deal, getting invited to the interview. It's fascinating to hear some of the commentary earlier today about how your presentation, how you are presented, and the energy that you bring to that really stays with you over an extended period of time. So the next opportunity for this particular individual is presenting himself to a director of tennis. I put it to you, um, Beth said before, she put her hand up and says, who, so, who does a social media check when they're hiring someone? You bet. The first thing that I do when I get a cover letter and resume is I go to LinkedIn. Don't say linked what, LinkedIn, <laughs> okay? Everybody, I mean, that is the reality. Facebook will tell me what you do on weekends. I'm looking for a presentation of you on LinkedIn that tells me what you do professionally. It is 
it is your first approach. I'm going to give you a little bit more example. So resume cover letter for a different day, managing creating awareness of your personal brand. And your personal brand is not Dumbledore Country Club, it's Dave Dvorak. It's not the standard club, it's Kip Lehman. That's the brand that we're talking about, not the club, okay? Your brand is everything about you. It's everything that people read or find out or are told or they learn about you. Um, and the reality is, in today's social media world, you know, the, the world of the, the internet, someone said once, right? Most of what's out there, you've put out there yourself. What you've written, not just what you've posted, but the article that you wrote that was picked up as a PDF and put online, the uh, story about the Pro-Am tournament that you raised money for charity in, the um, event that you went to and did a press release because you were educated and certified in a particular discipline in the industry. Most of what you've, you've put out there, or most of what's available, you've put out there. So that is a double-edged sword. Now, conversely, think of it like your reputation. And like your reputation, it's not easily changed without some very definite, <coughs> genuine, purposeful actions over time. So you can certainly impact what's online about you, but ultimately, the way you present yourself to the world has to align with where you want to be. And I want to share some examples of that. Now, some things that are out on the internet you can control. Some you cannot. Wrong slide. Okay, we'll come back to that. But, as you look at your personal brand, one more slide on the personal brand. It's everything that you do and say and act out and present. It's how you see yourself. It's how you write about something how you speak about things. And the reality is that your brand, both from what is shared by others and discovered independently, creates a perception of you long before you walk into the room for that interview. Long before you pick up the phone for the first telephone interview. And while you've had a chance to influence it, maybe in a first round interview, those memories remain as you think about your final interview when you are one of the last two or one of the last three. So it's a chance to change your perception. I think this is the slide. No, nah, not there yet, it's coming. Never get a chance to make a first. Nah, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. All right, social media. Yeah, that's the one I was looking for. <laughs> some of the things you can control and some of the things you can't. <laughs> Whew, that's about 35 years old, right? So, it, but it's still out there. I cannot control that, but I can control that. I can influence it by doing something today that ultimately will make this less relevant. Right, now, that's, that's not my point. My point is that you have things out there today that, you, that may not align with the job that you want tomorrow. And, and they're the things that we want to talk about. Now, the question I have here, all things being equal, number of years of experience, certification, um, quality of the cover letter, quality of the resume, and I'm going to select eight people to interview and I've got 11. Out of these two candidates, when we do the search, who might get the nod? Guy on the right or guy on the left? And I, I just, I'm asking the question, who says the guy on the right? Right? Because they, the guy on the right looks like he belongs as a director of tennis in a fine club, doesn't he? Now, am I, am I dissing on the person on the left because they're in, a t it's not a t-shirt, by the way. It is a, you know, a round neck tennis shirt. But the personality or the presentation, if you will, 
is a lot more aligned to a director of tennis in a private club, which is where I apply my trade in private clubs, than the gentleman on the left. Now, this particular individual, I have only just recently been introduced to, and only virtually, and it gave cause for me to go and search for her on LinkedIn. And Caitlin is our first vice president, maybe? Right? I think she's the vice president or first one of the division. Right? She is not long past 30 because she was involved with the division's 30 and under program. Right? So um, the way that I met Caitlin is we're going to be doing a little bit of a of a giveaway, and Caitlin and Bill Phillips agreed to serve on a on a of application committee and that she said yes she put her hand up and that's how I got to meet her and and I've asked for her permission she's going to allow me to quote something that is on her LinkedIn site but she took an interesting approach she's on the tennis court in a business suit right we've all seen that as well I think that looks great just a different look but Caitlin wrote an article that she posted on her LinkedIn site it was 10 tips for young professionals and she basically, it was like um, either I took this for my presentation or you took this for your article. I don't know what came first, but it was like an echo. You are your brand. Figure out ways to promote yourself. Be a constant professional in your day-to-day -day life and online. And your brand is on the ground and it's online. She says that I love social media, I promote my brand with it when an employer Googles my name. Well, she could very well have said a prospective employer. Uh, she's well employed right now in Raleigh, um, but a prospective employer or someone doing a search would come up and say, okay, she's got a blog, she's got a YouTube channel, she's got her LinkedIn page, she wants all of those networks to be a positive reflection of who, who I am, right? So, you know, she's talking about doing a tennis tip. It doesn't really matter what is on there, but it's a positive reflection and it aligns with her goal to be a director of tennis in a fine club. She's at a, a swim and tennis right now and she is a director of tennis. But as, as I talk to her, that they remain, or that remains, her immediate goal is to be a director of tennis. Now, here was the article. So it sits, you know, there's the thing, and there's all these collect connections, and that sits there. So if she applied for a job, I'd go to LinkedIn, I'd hit that, I'd see that, and say, I've at least got to pick up the phone and talk to her. This is someone that has, has it together, right? And then um, when I do a search, I go to the search committee and I do an assessment. I have them do an assessment of their program, right? Everything from their teaching to their programming to their special events to their maintenance to their hiring to their budget, they do a really full assessment and it's all very detailed and you know check the box. But at the end, there's a couple of open fields. And I ask the question, Please tell me what you consider to be the most important traits in your new profession. So this is the open field responses. This came, I just did a search in Connecticut. It was in December, finished in January. These were the exact comments that came from that search. Communication, energy, problem solving, business minded, passionate, good with people. Enthusiastic, easygoing, diplomatic, passionate, fun. A lot of soft skills up there, huh? Now, I, if, if Caitlin was here, it would be embarrassing. But do I get a feel for someone who is energetic and, and you know, power, uh, uh, easygoing and passionate about what she's doing and enthusiastic? And does she have... Uh, is she comfortable with technology? Does she have good communication skills? I don't know, but she didn't exclude herself, did she? As we look at her presentation and what this club may have been looking for. Now, 
there was no connection, just to say that. She was not in the mix. I only was introduced to her two weeks ago. That are two distinctly different statements. So when people do a resume, very often they'll say an objective. And if my opinion personally is that a statement about you and your brand, who you are, is a better position there than you know, my objective is to be a director of Townsend. Well, no kidding, you're applying for this job, right? Who are you? That's what people want to know. They want to understand who you are. And this particular person said, I'm, I'm a former round player, um, I'm a director of rackets already, I'm highly experienced in teaching tennis, directing programs, running events, managing pros, managing pro shops, right? Does he have it? He's got all the skills? Absolute spot on. Next branding statement. I create an environment that promotes fun and camaraderie together with providing and facilitating opportunities for members to learn new skills, compete and socialize together. Which statement just happens to align better with the soft, the uh, open field responses from the search committee? This by a long, long way. Does that mean that the other person is excluded from consideration? No. But as it starts to come down and, and really think about who is going to be a better cultural fit with this particular role, and this was just one role, it's not every role, this was one role, this particular statement fit a lot better, it aligned better culturally. So um, I digress there, but we were, we were kind of focusing on the fact that what you put out there and what you might put in your resume or cover letter together have a tremendous influence on being selected to have the chance to sell yourself in that interview for the role that you believe you are ready for, whatever that next role be, might be. And these were the things, these were uh, number six through ten of Caitlin's article on, you know, those are all skill sets and aspirations that align well with being a director at a fine club. So I would offer to you that it's almost your online interview. As you think about what you have out in the world that is you, it's how you speak, it's everything that you say, how you craft it. And I suggest to people that, you know, there's an edit button, and if there's stuff out there that doesn't quite fit the way you think it should fit, you may want to get rid of that. But you want, to, you want your presence online to be the presence that you would have in an interview. You want to dress, we've all heard this in the real world, you know, you go to a, uh, a breakfast or you go to a, um, an event, networking, you know, they say dress for the job you want, right? They teach you that in school. Well, I believe that that's very true online. Dress for how you would want to be perceived by the people that may have the opportunity to have an influence over your next career move. Post about things that matter to the type of place that you want to be a part of. Again, your presence, your brand needs to align with where you want to work. Um, the concept of creating a vision, and I, we all heard this earlier today as well. When you are at the point of having earned the interview, so we're, we're focused on those skills, those gaps, and we've presented a great resume, we've presented a great cover letter, we're, we're going to get this interview, right? And from the time you write the cover letter to the time you're in that interview, you've got to be in the realm of creating a vision of what you're going to look like to the people when you are successfully running that program. Now, this up here is a pile of poop. And I would suggest that really, no one really cares about how well you play, how many kids you've ranked, have taken to, to you know, national rankings, um, 
how well you run an event. And you say, well, how is that possible? They don't care how well I run an event. They don't care how well I teach. They don't care. Well, that's considered to be the baseline. If you're applying for a job that, that you think you belong in, <coughs> everyone else that's applying have those core skills. The core skills are absolute. They go without saying. It doesn't mean that they're not verified and that they're not checked on, but everyone has those skills. It's the subtle differences that make the difference in who ultimately is hired into these roles. And the director of tennis is looking for someone that can do that as their head professional. The general manager is looking for someone who can do that as their director of tennis. So the core skills are important, but they don't convey who you are and why you do what you do. Now, in my opinion, that's what people hire. And, and I've heard that today a couple of times, which only made me feel stronger about the belief that these are the skills that we need to focus on. I like to put it as such that people want to know what impact you're going to have on their world, on their job, on if it's a director hiring a head pro, how are you going to make my job easier, make my members happier? If I'm a general manager, how are you going to wow my members? How are you going to create an environment that people want to come and work for you at this club? Members want to bring their guests, they want to have the best events, you're going to make our tennis program great. How are you going to do that? And they don't want to know the specifics of the teaching and the running. They want to understand the vision that you're going to create. So what impact will you have? And how does that align with your purpose? What is your why? Why do you do what you do? How will your purpose as a director of tennis impact our program? So they want to visualize you as a professional running their program at their club. Not your program, their program at their club. So the vision is the, is the key here. And you know, Tim got up and talked about this earlier. And my gosh, if you can have his enthusiasm when you went in for an interview, it'd be hard to turn down. That's a vision. I'm going to finish up with one last aspect of hiring. And I've heard it said that, oh, it's who you know. Right? Have you heard that before? Who you know. That's what gets people hired. True or false? Can't. <laughs> I've kind of set the table here with the slide, right? It's false in terms of getting hired. It's very often true in getting the opportunity to get hired. So that's why I took the approach, don't ever let it be said, that who you know isn't important. It is. But it can be so casual, it is almost you know, a distant connection. It could be um, we're down in on Hilton Head Island and uh, they're running a pro-am, they're a pro short, I'm on vacation with my wife, the pro has let us play tennis there, we help out shorts a couple of hours, we play, I have a partner, we play one round against a guy, he's just a slap on the back guy, you kind of hit it off afterwards, you sit down and have a beer and you, you introduce yourself and you tell them about where you are and what you do, and you say, hey, if you ever come to my hometown and want to hit some tennis balls, you give them the card and away you go, and you go to the beach the next day, and off you go. And three months later, he's having lunch at his city club in Chicago with his business partner from Charlotte, who says, you know, we're, we're going to find a director of tennis, our guy just, just quit on us. Oh, man, I met this guy at Hilton Head about a month ago, we were on vacation, I was playing this pro-am, he was a slap-ass guy, he talked funny. <laughs> and I was never hired that way, but it's possible, right? The story's plausible. But it, in terms of committees, I do hear this a lot. You have to get this guy and talk to him. 
because we, we do all the interviews, we send out questionnaires and so forth. Oh, you're going to send the questionnaire, Let's, he's going to be a good guy. Da, 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 da. And the committee people do go to bat for their person. There is no question that that happens. But a good general manager, and I'd like to offer a good search consultant, can keep the search objective and on track. But getting to that interview is critical and the network can help make that happen, I promise you. So with that being said, I'm gonna take a different approach because we've all heard about the importance of networking, right? So my wife, some of you know, work, works in technology. So she sells access points and she talks about firewalls and routers, even though when the internet goes down at home, I have to fix it, right? And that's because she works with an engineer. So she's the solutions person and this guy she works with is the, you know, the, the uh, what do you call it, the nerd, right, the techno nerd. So I'm gonna use a little different technology. I thought we had all these young people in the room, so I was like, oh, this is gonna be really hip and cool, right? But access points, firewalls, and routers, you know what they do? Access points, what does access point do? What's it do, access point? Come on, access point. I'm looking around, I'm looking for it. It's up here somewhere. Because we are online, yes. Somewhere in this room, there is a access point that is allowing your phone, if you're on it, the Dunwoody Country Club network, to be on the network. It might be right there. But an access point allows traffic to get to the network. A router takes that traffic and decides what is the most advantageous an efficient way to move it. Okay? Firewall, you all know what firewall is, stops the bad stuff and it allows the good stuff to come through. So apply that to your networking for a moment. Think about that. Routers, access points, firewalls. We'll come back to each one. Today's network is people driven. It is not technology driven. Technology is a great tool and I, I strongly, highly recommend that you utilize it. When I have learned, I've learned a little bit about online marketing and about the concept of geotargeting. And this is a bit of a pun. Geotargeting is when you are in a particular area and you pull up the SPN or the Weather Channel on your phone and you happen to see a certain ad. And the ad comes up that is for the patio furniture and you think, geez, patio furniture. I was online at my computer at home looking at patio furniture last week. My internet guy here knows what I'm talking about. And all of a sudden it's populating your phone with an ad for patio furniture. It's because your phone was in the same location as the computer that you worked on uh, a week ago looking up patio furniture and the cookies that it put on your phone now say when this guy comes online next time send him an ad for patio furniture. That's geotargeting, right? Crazy, but true, right? Um, but you can geotarget right here your network. And I believe that you need to be where you want to work. And I'll, I'll talk about that briefly in just a moment. Build a web, right? Another pun, right? So you got the internet, while World Wide Web, sure, but build the web. Take it out from who you know. You need to be on the ground. You need to be out there participating, volunteering, contributing, getting uncomfortable. Um, if if uh, I knew Bill Phillips, when Pat invited Bill to serve on this committee, Bill said yes. I didn't know Caitlin. I'd never have met Caitlin if she hadn't have said yes to Pat, right? And because she said yes to Pat, I don't know if I'll ever talk to Caitlin relative to a job. I have no idea, but I might talk to someone else who might be talking to Caitlin about a job. There's the network, right? I feel like she is pretty good pro. I say, yeah. Everything I know, pretty positive. Bang, check mark. Next person they go to talk to, right? That's the network. Access points, it allows you to get on the network. We know what they are. This is an access point. It's all the things we do, not just for our brand and for our career, but for our club and our lesson book. 
we go to local events, we participate in our local community, we volunteer. But think about going a little bit further. If you've never written an article that is somehow out in the, in the domain, public domain somewhere, everyone in this room has multiple skills that they are as good, if not better, than anybody else at. Share that knowledge, share that expertise. That's not only going to make you feel good, it's not only going to give you some recognition, one day it may help you get invited to an interview. And to me, that's a win-win, right? Um, charity events and pro-ams. So I suggested to this individual from the Midwest that they try and get an invitation to a pro-am in that area. Right? Offer to help out. When you have a week's vacation, do you need, can I come in and shadow your, your pro? I'm trying to learn more about the tennis area, about the tennis industry in Florida. And we are, we are so blessed because our industry is so willing to share. If he extends himself into that market, not just lands there with a suitcase off the plane, but if he sets it up and wants to go do something in that market, he could do it. If someone asked you to do, do something like that, you would do it for them. Be where you want to work. Across town, different state, across the country. Find a way to do it. Firewalls, things that screw up the traffic, that they stop the bad traffic from getting through, they allow the good traffic to keep going. So think about when you don't follow up with someone that is a firewall. You are creating a firewall to your own network. Or no follow-up, not staying in touch. I had a colleague, follow, fellow USPTA member once, and sadly we made a comment one night over someone and we said, yeah, the only time you ever hear from them is when they want something. Don't be that person. Contribute, volunteer. It is a win-win. You feel good about the action. You feel the person will benefit from whatever expertise you have to share. And you know what? One day it might just help you as well. Inappropriate behavior or appearance. On court, online. Your brand is on court and online. Think about your appearance. Think about what you're saying. Spreading inaccurate information. The routers are the people who are willing to share your message. And just like the people that are, or just like the, the router itself, the, this is the technology and these are the people that can take your goal and help share it across the network of where you want to be. So they are your current colleagues they are friends of colleagues, they are future friends. I would suggest don't hesitate to ask for help. Don't hesitate to ask for an introduction. The concept that Joel Manby shared with us this morning about the note card, love that. I hope, I hope that I have the discipline to do that. I love that. But what a great way of genuinely engaging with your network. So, our gentleman from the Midwest, you're hired. Now, I just want to do a little disclaimer here. He is not the head pro of the Jacksonville Country Club. I don't know who he is. I should probably reach out and let them know that I'm not filling their job. But, but hypothetically, is he done? No, he's just done, right? He's really got to think in terms of his five-year goal. And whatever your goal might be, you achieve a small part of it, you're constantly moving against it. You're, pro you're constantly moving forward step by step. So, we'll wrap up where we started. Think about the goal that you have. Assess where you are and figure out, hey, can I get there from here realistically? And you know what? Maybe with one or two little tweaks, yep, you're ready to go. Or you may have to sidestep and take a little dodge step or a, an intermediate goal first 
And that intermediate goal may not be a job change. It might be a course. It might be some focused learning or shadowing. But either way, clarify your goal, I'm going after it, or recalibrate it, then set up your action steps. Think about your personal brand, make sure you invest in your network. So the question remains, if circumstances changed, what, where, and how long would it take? If you aspire to something, and you want to move into a new role, same question, what, where, and how long? So if luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity, then I think the conventional wisdom would say spend some time on the preparation because the opportunities are most certainly going to be prevalent. They're certainly going to come up. So we're going to wrap it up. Pat, do you want me to mention the... Um, we'll take a couple of questions maybe or... Yes, but I want you to, so we have a, a new program that's about to come out that we're doing together. So yes, I would really like, because you can explain it better than I can, so okay. please. I'll do that in one second. Any questions? Because I covered a lot of information and sometimes that can be a little tough at five o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. But I got one. Yes, sir. And sorry, I've been in and out having to do some stuff. So if, I, if this was covered, then just slap me and I'll watch it on the video. <laughs> Did you cover what the one or two biggest pitfalls are that you see from people that in their job search? Did you, did you actually go into that? I did. The one, of, one we talked about already, and it was funny, Tim made a comment earlier today, I don't know if anyone picked up on my slides or not, but he says, darn it, on his last slide, he had one, one little thing on there, right? It, typos are still the, the number one thing. And I did not follow that practice. I did not have anyone review this, like for spelling and so forth, right? And that is always an absolute guarantee. It's, it's such an obvious thing, right? Um, in terms of the other most significant pitfall is I think it's, it's a combination of two things, okay? It's spewing skills. Um, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And I heard someone say earlier today that they saw the same resume and cover letter a year between, right? There was nothing relevant to the job that was advertised. There was nothing changed. Your cover letter and your resume. And you say, well, Mark, how can your resume change? It doesn't. But how it's presented and the things that you qualify and, and the metrics that you provide need to be relative to the job. And if you are looking at certain types of jobs, they are pretty much going to remain the same, but there might be some slight changes based upon your, what your network has told you about a job. So if you're going for a director of tennis in suburban, Atla suburban Atlanta, it might be a little bit different than the job you might have applied for in Birmingham two months earlier. So I think really tailoring the cover letter and resume and not just spewing out what you're good at would be the, the, the other most critical error, I guess, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Yeah. Jim? Yeah, Mark, when I was making the transition from tennis road to corporate life and nonprofit. I, must, I looked at my computer, I must have about 30 different resumes. I have a non-profit resume, business resume, tennis resume, and all the different cover letters. So when I, I wanted to emphasize what I did in the tennis industry, all the non-profit events that I had run and so forth, I highlighted those when I was searching for a non-profit role in whether it was marketing, whether it was uh, event planning, management. I brought all those to the forefront, downplayed all of teaching skills and so forth. So definitely tailored my resume according to what I was going for. Yeah, super, super important. Is Bruce Spike still a member of the club here? No. So Bruce was a, a mentor to me. And he talked about transferable skill sets. So when I went to the USDA, 
I, I highlighted the things that I'd learned as a tennis professional that were relative to the role that the USDA was for. So, you know, that was something Bruce really helped me figure out. And um, he does, you know, he used to do that, I think, with kind of executives who were um, outplaced. Yeah. I think. No, uh, either way, yeah, go on, sorry. Uh, throw a little indirect, but relates to all of this, the whole concept of looking at individuals within our organization, how important the growth and the mentoring of any potential to replace rather than have the goal. Even though we do an outside search, an internal candidate has so many advantages over in terms of culture and other things. Just recently, we had a retirement, and we had a promotion that opened two spots in directorships. Right. And we promoted one from within, and the other was external. External fantastic candidate. But it's going to take a year for that individual to really be able to truly embrace and understand everything about our culture and the operation. So just wondering if you had any thoughts on on that at all, Mark, in terms of looking at who we, if I, I mean, if I was a board member uh, I might want to be a document dentist director in terms of making sure they hire somebody who potentially could replace that individual. Yeah, you know, Butch, you, you touch on a really important thing because there's a lot of individual tennis directors who take that as a personal mission to do. You know, I can think over the years the number of people have helped me, but also I've watched help other people. And it's not something that is typically recommended as a... Um, as a job description for the director of tennis by the club. But you're right, it's expensive to have that turnover. So if, if you are a director, then what Butch is suggesting is you're, you're adding greater value by investing in and helping to develop the team that are, are around you, without a doubt. If you are not a director, then maybe you need to be asking for that development and coaching because it's something that really is is a critical component now um, i'm more familiar with with what the uspta is doing but i gotta tell you i signed up for and and i've done the mentor program for the last year and i'm working with someone out of boston massachusetts and i have gotten honestly probably more out of it than than he has i hope i think it's probably a win-win but it's been really, really good. So there's a lot of you in this room I know that could be mentors for pros around the country, and I know they just put another uh, ask out for that. So I just want to kind of speak for that. It's been something that's 